this is Sidra, and today we are talking about fluids part 2, assessment and administration. People who need fluids have either lost it, aren't getting enough of it, or it is in a place where it can't be used. Let's start with increased loss. In a setting where the patient is acutely unwell, whether ED or in the ward, the patient should be assessed using the airway breathing and circulation principles, or ABC. Airway is assessed by talking to the patient, ask their name and age, and if they're able to answer without difficulty, their airway is clear. Breathing is assessed by counting the respiratory rate, applying a SATS monitor, and auscultation. If the patient is tachypneic, that might be a sign that the patient is volume down, and on the other hand, if you hear crackles, that might indicate fluid overload. Next is C for circulation. Before we talk about that though, let's draw our patient. So you're standing at the edge of the bed looking at this person, and you've assessed their airway to be clear. They are breathing hard, you've auscultated their lungs, so now you monitor their pulse. They are tachycardic, so you apply a blood pressure monitor and find that their systolic blood pressure is low. When you were feeling their pulse, you noticed that their hands were cold, and so you pressed on their nail and found that their cap refill is delayed. According to the NICE guidelines, if your heart rate is more than 90, and your systolic blood pressure is less than 100, that is a sign that you might need fluid resuscitation. So what do you do? Well, you now insert two large bore IV cannulae in their anticubital fossa and take bloods. You'll take a FOBA count, urine electrolyte, coagulation, liver function test, and bloods for cross-matching. In the other arm, you'll run fluids. What kind of fluids? Well, we know for initial resuscitation, crystalloids are better than colloid, as long as the sodium content is between 130 and 154 millimoles per liter, which gives us the choice between Ringer's lactate and normal saline. It doesn't matter which one you choose, whatever's available, as long as it's warm, as long as it's stacked. So you give 500 mils first, a bolus, in less than 15 minutes, and then you reassess the patient's airway breathing circulation. If they're not better, you can repeat the 500 ml boluses up until you reach two liters, at which point, if they're not better, call an expert. Call an expert whenever you feel out of depth, and especially if your patient is old, has a cardiac issue or a kidney issue, and if they do, then try giving them smaller boluses of 250 ml. One way of assessing uh, fluid loss is to raise the patient's uh, leg up by 45 degrees and if their blood pressure and heart rate improve, that means that they would benefit from fluids. This is only in patients that are not um, too bad. You don't want to be wasting time raising people's legs in an emergency situation. So this was our resuscitation portion of fluid management. Just some points to remember, uh, never add potassium to rhesus fluid bags and don't resuscitate with fluids containing a lot of potassium. Try replacing blood for blood as well. And remember blood on the floor and for more. So you can have an obvious bleeding or you can have more obscured bleeding in the abdominal pelvic cavity, in the thorax, long limbs, and in the retroperitoneum, which might not be super obvious besides the fact that the patient isn't getting better. Let's talk about D and E for completion's sake. So disability can be monitored through the GCS. If the patient is confused, that might give you a clue into decreased perfusion to the brain, which could be due to fluid loss, and exposure will help you identify any open wounds or stomas from where they might be lo losing that fluid. There might be situations where the patient isn't taking in enough fluids, and in that instance, check whether they're able to eat or drink per oral. If yes, encourage oral fluids. However, if they are unable to do so, if you've kept them nil by mouth for surgery, they have an unsafe swallow, can't drink because of bowel obstruction, or they have post-op ileus, you'll need to replace their daily needs. And how do we calculate that? Well, there are four areas from where we lose most of our body water, and what we are losing is what we need to give ourselves back. One of those areas is the GI tract. Our colon is really good at reabsorbing all of the digestive juices that we need. Um, however, we still lose 300 mils with our stool. Our urinary system is another big source of loss. 
our kidneys produce 1500 to 2000 mils of urine every single day and their content and amount can vary according to the ADH and aldosterone release. We can lose variable amounts of water by sweating and by humidifying the air that we breathe in through our respiratory tract. So if somebody has a fever or is breathing hard, they might be losing a lot of fluid. This is usually around 400 mils and these losses are called insensible losses. Um, we produce 300 mils of metabolic water and 700 in insensible losses and the net effect is 400 mils. Based on this, NICE guidelines recommend calculating maintenance as 25 to 30 mils per kg per day of water. In obese patients, we will use their ideal weight. To this water, we need to add the daily electrolyte requirements, so sodium chloride and potassium, and that's calculated as one millimole per kg per day. Potassium comes in bags of 20 or 40. You never add potassium to IV bags, you just round it up to the nearest bag. You give it slow at 10 milli equivalents per hour. We need about 50 to 100 grams of glucose per day and that's to prevent ketotic starvation. However, it will not provide nutrients to the patient. So if somebody is on maintenance fluids, you need to reassess them every single day. And what you'll write in your plan is for a daily review, for daily urea and electrolytes and for blood count to um, measure their hemoglobin. We'll need to do weights on them twice weekly. We'll need to keep a fluid balance chart of their input output. And if somebody has been on fluids for more than three days, then we need to think of putting in a nasogastric, nasogestional or PEG tube. Remember to review daily and to write the stop and start date on your prescription. That wraps up the topic of routine maintenance fluids and in another video we'll go over some examples to make this clearer. In all of our examples so far, the patients were clearly in need of fluids. But what do we do with patients who are kind of in between? Well, we start with their history. In the history you'd ask questions about whether they've been eating or drinking and if they feel thirsty. Do they have vomiting or diarrhea? And if they're passing lots of urine or very little? if the urine is dark or light. Being fluid down can cause dizziness and syncope, so ask about that. Furthermore, inquiring about fever and hyperventilation will give you a clue about insensible losses. For diarrhea and vomiting, it's important to ask about amount, duration, frequency, any blood, and estimated volumes. In past medical history, ascertain if they have any cardiac, liver, GI, or renal issues, or if they suffer from diabetes. It is really important to find out about their medications, especially if the patient is on diuretics, laxatives, antibiotics that cause diarrhea, and salt-wasting SSRIs. You can also check their post-op notes and see if they had significant blood loss or complications. Do they have an anastomosis, any drains in situ, or any fistulae that can cause fluid loss? Examination starts at the end of the bed, where you pick up the patient's early warning chart and notice their vitals. Look for their weight in the nursing notes or if they don't have one, get a new one. Next, you'll perform an exam to check the hydration status of the patient. First off, inspection. Stand away and notice if the patient looks pale, sweaty, or if they have sunken eyes. They may be breathing fast as well. Do they have any central lines or if their JVP is visible? Look for obvious ascites and drains and stomas in the abdomen. Check the stoma bag if they have one. Make a note of the urine output. This may be from a urinary catheter or their fluid balance chart. Expose their legs to check for peripheral edema and don't forget about fistulae. Palpation. Check skin turgor by pinching the skin on the back of their hands gently and releasing. Dehydrated skin is less elastic. Although, do keep in mind wrinkles and the age of the patient. At this point, palpate the JVP and abdominal distension. Auscultate the lungs, listening for bibasal creps. Listen to the heart and check bowel sounds for obstruction or ileus. Don't forget to check incision sites for bleeding and collection formation. Now let's take our history examination and data from the nasogastric tubes, lines, stomia, drains and fistulae to make an educated guess about how much the patient has lost in fluids and electrolytes. 
Gastric juices usually contain sodium, potassium, and lots of chloride and hydrogen ions, so in vomiting, acid is lost. Pancreatic juices are alkaline. It contains high amounts of sodium and chloride, some potassium, and lots of bicarb. This is what is lost through fistulae or in pancreatitis. Through a jejunostomy, potassium, bicarb, and large amounts of sodium chloride are lost. The ostomies can be similar to jejunum or the colon, depending on if it is high or low or new or established. In diarrhea or colostomy, sodium, potassium, and bicarb are lost and bile contains bile salts so sodium chloride is high and it is alkaline to counter stomach acid so bicarb is also high. These estimates will guide our investigations and what or how much we replace. So investigations can be divided into bloods and imaging. For bloods we will send a full blood count, urea and electrolytes along with the magnesium. Any disease specific bloods can also be added example a BNP for heart failure, LFTs for ascites or liver disease, bone profile can be often useful in chronic kidney disease. A urinary sodium of less than 30 millimoles can point to a GI cause of loss. For imaging, we can do a chest x-ray to obtain information about pulmonary edema and effusions. It can also show cardiomegaly. Abdominal ultrasound for liver and ascites, ultrasound KUB for kidney problems, CT scan for fistula and leaks, and an echo for congestive cardiac failure. Now that a fluid and electrolyte excess or deficit has been identified, we need to be mindful of whether it existed beforehand or is it still continuing at the moment. In the existing category, we have fluid overload, dehydration, and hypo or hyperkalemia. In the ongoing category, we have tubes, drains, continuous vomiting, stoma, fistulae, diarrhea, unresolved bleeding, and fever, sweating, and being kept NPO. Fever, sweating, and NPO, you only lose water and not too many electrolytes with it. Uh, we have urinary losses like in diabetes insipidus and post-acute kidney injury polyuria. To calculate how much to give back in urinary losses, take the urinary output and subtract 30 mils from it. Calculate maintenance as we discussed before and then add the existing loss as well as what you think will be the ongoing loss over the next 24 hours into the maintenance fluids. Subtract if you think the patient is overloaded, volumes are obtained from the fluid balance chart or an estimate, and the electrolytes from the electrolyte chart we did before. These patients will need increased monitoring of their vital signs, urea and electrolytes, and full blood counts. That concludes our overview of replacement of fluids and some electrolytes. We'll go over some examples in the next video which will help put all of this together. The last topic is quite challenging. In redistribution, fluid is present in the body but in a space where it cannot be adequately used to increase the blood pressure or perfuse the organs. It can get trapped in dilated cutaneous blood vessels or trapped in a third space like the interstitial space. So if you see someone with severe sepsis, gross edema, hypo or hypernatremia, uh, renal, cardiac, or liver issues, uh, post-op massive fluid shifts, malnourishment, or refeeding syndrome, seek expert help. If you like this video, hit the like button, share the video far and wide, and subscribe to the channel for videos every once in a while. We'll be coming out with part three next week. See ya then! Thank you.